legend. Hi, Pete. How are you? I'm fine. Yourself? Oh, doing fantastic. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's good. It's early morning for you. Yes, yes. A beautiful morning in Southern <laughs> California. <laughs> okay, okay. Don't rub it. I don't want to rub it in. I know. I know it's got to be a little cooler over there. Uh, just a little bit, yeah. Yeah. In terms of. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on on so many great years of giving us so much pleasure. You know, with Nazareth, I know you guys go back to '68, so I know you're rocketing towards that 50th anniversary, and I want to be the first to congratulate you on a half a century. <laughs> Yo, thank you, thank you very much. Amazing stuff. Uh, now, to tell us, I know you guys were inspired by the Beatles and the Stones, and so much great music back then. But give us a little. Uh, insight, you know, on how all the guys in Nazareth, you know, came together? Well, basically, uh, we, we were, uh, it was a band that I started back in 1961, a band called the Shadets in Dunfermline in Scotland, and it was just a local, you know, a local band in our town uh, that we played around, and then we, we got quite well known within Scotland, um, and eventually, you know, I was a lead singer with that band. And along the way, we picked up different guys. We picked up the first drummer, Daryl Sweet. He joined the band. And then eventually, Dan, who's my, he was my friend, you know, from school. When sure. we were we were five years old, we sat next to each other on the first day at school. Um, so we'd been friends all our life. He used to run around with me, with a band. Um, and come, like, around about, oh, about 1965, uh, Somebody that we you know, one of one of the guys that used to sing with me in the band. We used to do a double vocal type thing. You know, we used to do all the stack stuff and the uh, and that kind of stuff. You know, down at the clubs here. And this guy left, and we thought, well, Dan can sing. Get him in. And we can have the two of us singing. So it was the best thing we ever did, really. <laughs> and, uh, so he he joined, and it was still the Shadets. And then eventually, you know, Manny Charlton, he played in a different group. He joined as the guitar player after the guitar player left. And that was it up until, you know, 68. And we decided we needed a, a name change then, you know. And then we had the four guys then for the, that became Nazareth. Um, you know, the Shadets was not really a kind of... You know, at, at that time you had names like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Vanilla, you know, Vanilla Fudge and you know, Deep Purple. It was all kind of heavy names. The Shadets sounded a bit like wussy, you know. <laughs> so uh, we thought we needed a change and that was it, really. That, that was it. And that was in the... I was 68 that that band was formed, yeah. So I understand you, you pulled the, the name of the band from the the lyric in the band song, The Wait, as they pulled in the Nazareth. Aye. Well, we were all sitting, we, we were sitting in a local hotel trying to think up names, you know, and all the usual stupid names were getting floated back and forth with everybody trying to be funny. And uh, that the record came on at the time, The Wait. Now, we actually used to, we used to do the song, what, what they should is, and uh, it came on while we were sitting talking, the four of us, and I said, I said, what about Nazareth? It sounds good, you know? And the guy said, well, well, nobody jumped up and down and went, oh, yeah, 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 that's the name. They just said, well, let's write it down, and we wrote it down, and went, mm, it was, it was okay, you know? And uh, so that was that. We just, uh, it just became Nazareth. Uh, of course, we used to have a... Uh, at that time, we were still just what we call a part-time band. We were still at day jobs and things, you know? Um, it was another little while before we... Actually, we went and made our first album and started writing songs and went and made our first album. Because when we came to the States and we used to travel, you know, before the tour bus days, everybody used to fly everywhere. And of course, Nazareth, we used to keep a your religious group, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we used to get a lot of that. Everybody thought, uh, just because of the name. Right. Uh, so we lived through that one. We lived through that one anyway. But um, no, it was, it was just, uh, as I say, it was inspired by. Well, the band was one of our favourite bands anyway. You know, that was where, at the time, the the people that influenced us, you know, and uh, sure. so that was, that, that's where we punched them in. That was it. So you made the move down to London in, in 70 and, and, and took it seriously at that point? It was 71 we went down to, and we, 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 you had to, at that time, you, you know, well, I, I think you were, you were, you know, born back here or something I did, I know, hear about that. Sure. Um, uh, have, I, have, I got, have I got the right guy here? You won't, you won't remember much about it though. I think you were pretty young when you went away. Sure. Uh, the the um, 
in, in, we were in Scotland, and when you were up in Scotland, there was no way that the record business was going to come up and take a look at anybody in Scotland. It just didn't happen, you know. Right. As soon as you got in North London, uh, that's where the record business stopped, uh, uh, where the record companies stopped looking. Except for those four guys from Liverpool, that kind of changed things a bit. But um, other than that, you know, up in Scotland, you, you, you just, uh, nobody made records. Uh, so you had to you had to come down and you had to be down there. You had to be in London. You had to be there, you know, in the business. It doesn't matter anymore now. You know, communicating right. is completely different. But we're looking back that so a long, long 45 years ago, you know, and that, that wasn't the case. And 45 years ago, if you wanted to do anything, you had to have your office in London, you had to have your management in London, and everything had to be in London. You know, the whole of the British rock business and the whole of, whole of the British entertainment business and especially in the music business, we to London, and that was it, you know. Um, and so that's where we went. You know, we went to where the business was, really. And uh, that's uh, otherwise, you know, you'd have been wasting your time. I mean, not, as I say, sitting in Scotland, you, there was lots and lots of really good bands up there, you know. Yeah. And we used to, well, all, all our friends, all the guys that we used to play with, I mean, great, great bands. They, they just never, they would never get the chance to go, you know, down and you know, well, just never get the chance to do it, you know. It's like, so it's a bit like in the States as well, you know, you get the guys, I mean, I'd, I'd see, like said, Richie Hayward playing with Little Feet, you yeah. know, the, the drummer. Who, the, I mean, Richie, you know, he was born in, you know, bumfuck someplace, Wyoming, oh. or, in, you know, someplace in the middle of Idaho or something, you know. You don't, you don't make it there unless you move to LA or you move to New York, you know. Yeah, and, of course. And the same thing in, in Britain, it was, you went to London, you know, that was it. So I guess it was uh, getting on the uh, tour with Deep Purple that led to your your tenure with uh, Roger Glover producing the band. Yeah. Tell us tell us how you befriended Roger and how he helped you make those great albums, you know, like Loud and Proud and sure. Razzmatazz. Well, Deep Purple, we, we we played some dates with them when when we supported them when they came up to Scotland when we played in the, the local. Ballroom, really, we were the resident band, as I said. We met them then, we in the the, the sixties, and when we came to when we came to London we, at seventy one, in nineteen seventy two, they were doing a tour. I think they'd just done Machine Head, and they were doing a tour. They were really breaking it, really big, large in America, and they took us on our very first American tour. They took us. There was them, and there was Buddy Miles, and we were like the opening band that did what half an hour. 25 minutes, 30 minutes or something, but they took us on that tour uh, right across America, and it, would, it did us, obviously, it did us a lot of good, and we became very, very friendly with the guys because of that, so when we came back from that, they were doing, uh, uh, the, the, later on in that year, they were doing uh, a, British, a British tour, you know, so they took us as the, the support band on the British tour. Again, you know, they were very, very big in Britain, so we were playing to big you know, big audiences. It was, it, it did us, it really did us a lot of favours, you know. And while we were doing that, we were thinking about going in to do a third album. The first one obviously did not very much. The second one did even less. And uh, we still really didn't have a direction, you know, how, what kind of, what, what we wanted to be, you know. Uh, the, the second album wasn't really a rock album. It was more for a very, very soft thing. But we wanted to be a rock band, basically. So when we had the material ready for the Razum and Az album, we were playing it on the Deep Purple tour. We were playing that material. And we started to talk to Roger. We were talking about producers. And I think at one point, oh, there was different people we were talking about getting, hoping to get, like Jimmy Page was one, uh, Pete Townsend was another, that they were bandying these names of it. And then Roger, you know, and Roger was... Uh, Roger's first kind of productions I remember he did with, when Ronnie Dio was with a band called Elf do you remember them? Oh sure it was the, the, the Elf well, yes. he produced him and the, 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 the Elf album and, and I was I, I thought Elf were a fabulous band and uh, we knew that Roger had he did a lot with Deep Purple as well <clears throat> he had a lot to do with the actual production you know so when we got talking to him on that tour the British tour you know uh, we thought, well, maybe we started to discuss producers and Roger. Eventually, the way he was kind of speaking to us, uh, we thought, maybe this could be the guy, you know? So we asked him on the tour if he was interested, and of course he was very interested. 
and it's the best thing we did actually because uh, I think that's what the, those three albums uh, Rasmus has Live and Proud and Rampant those were the three albums that actually put the band um, on the planet well for Europe anyway all of Europe everywhere except America Canada were huge it was big in South America America the US was the only place that it, they didn't really go large there because you know, we didn't have a hit we didn't have a hit single from uh, those ones in the States, but we had hit singles everywhere else, you know. So Roger really did do us, uh, bro his production and his attitude towards making records, you know, um, and he taught us an attitude to how to make records, really how to make records, really. That's, that's, we learn how to make records with them. And, uh, and that's through us instead for everything we've done since. But those three albums were the ones that really you know, put put us in touch. Um and it wasn't it was it was well actually it was the album after Roger left that we got the hit in America with, you know, but that was I thought just a timing thing really. I'm sure I'm right. doing that one as well, you know. Well, well tell us about that period because obviously Roger helped you, you know, define your sound and really catapult the band to another level. Mm. But it was the Hair of the Dog album that Manny produced that really you know, broke you here in America, and of course gave you some of your your biggest you know hits. Um, talk talk yeah, about well, why uh, that change was made, and uh, basically creating you know songs like the title track "Hair of the Dog," which has been a a classic forever. That's right. Well, I mean, it was a swear word that got us to great getting it banned was the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> you know what happened was. Uh, you know, we've done three albums with Roger, and everybody thought, well, that's enough. You know, we should have a change. Everybody should. No, we didn't, you know, we didn't fall out or anything like that. We're still really good friends. Um, and we're, and in fact, I'm playing, uh, I believe we're, we're doing a date uh, in America this year with Deep Purple uh, coming up. But we, we still play. I played a couple of shows last year with them in uh, Finland and things like that. But um, no, at that time, it, Manny had always wanted to produce anyway. You know, he, he's, he was always the, the, the record maker, you know, the, the one to make records like that. And uh, when we were doing, we went to do Hair of the Dog, which was called Son of a Bitch, obviously. But uh, we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to call, you know, we, we, when we did it, we, we, the name of the album was Son of a Bitch. And of course, A&M Records went, oh God, you know, Sears won't sell it, you know. And we were thinking, you know, what's the big deal, Son of a Bitch? I mean, in every American movie I'd seen, everybody had said that. You know, John Wade said, son of a bitch. You know, so it must be fine, you know. Right. But seemingly no. So it ended up being, it started after that being Air of the Dog, and which turned into Hair of the Dog. But what happened with that record was we did, uh, you know, at that time, uh, when we switched, switched over and managed, did, did produce that record, we did it in a little cheap studio uh, down in Kent. And what happened was uh, we did... Love Hurts, which was uh, from the Emily Harris and, and, and Graham Parsons. Graham Parsons and Emily Harris did it on the Grievous Angel album, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to listen to that while we were driving around in a group van. And we always thought, well, at that time you would take a, a single off a record and then you would have to put a B-side on it. So the, the bands all then started, they used, to take, they used to take your album and they'd take a track and then they'd take another track from the album and put it on the B-side. So you were throwing your whole album away, you know, yeah. and it was still, it was silly. So bands started to make B sides, you know, that were never ever going to go on the album, and uh, a lot of them were just a lot of nonsense. A, a jam that you had in the studio, just something to stick on the back of a single. And we did we did the Love Hurts as a B side, and the only Hair of the Dog album that that's on is in America. It's not on Hair of the Dog throughout the rest of the world. Throughout the rest of the world, the slow track on it is Guilty. The Randy Newman song, and that's the song that was on Hair of the Dog all the way. Now, when we took the album to Jerry Moss at A and M Records, he listened to the album, and then he heard Love Hurts that we were going to do as a B side, and he said, "I want that on the album. You can take Guilty off, and I want to put that record on the album because that's the one for me." Thank God for Jerry Moss is all I can say because it was the biggest hit we ever had. And it was a huge, huge hit in, uh, uh, all over the world. But it was, it was the one that broke America for us. And because it was a big hit as a single, the band got noticed, so people started to look at the album, you know. And, of course, once they heard the album, they realized it wasn't just a ballad band, it was a, it was a rock band. And uh, 
the track that everybody, you know, at that time you used to have the college, the college radio stations, you know, sure. uh, they, they, and they were they, they, they were very very they had a lot of it. they were very influential in America right across America. You know, the call the college could play whatever they liked, and of course nobody would play F, um, AM stations would never have played Hair of the Dog, son of a bitch. Right. No way, you know. But the college stations loved it for that the very for that very reason, you know. Yeah. I mean, you've got to think back again to nineteen seventy five, seventy six here, you know. Nowadays you've got motherfucker, cocksucker and everything on right. records. You didn't have that then, you know. We didn't have that then. And Son of a Bitch was very risky, you know. Yeah, it's hard to believe that was uh, an issue at the time, but uh, obviously oh, that look, song has lived on and you know, even Guns yeah, N' Roses, yeah. you know, covered covered that song. What what was that like That's hearing right. that uh, Axl Rose and Guns N' Roses was going to cover that song? Who at the time they were like the biggest band in the world. Uh, yeah, well, see, the boys were. The, the thing is, just before before they did, uh, before they cracked it really, really big. Guns N' Roses, Axl. I mean, Dan's. Well, he makes no bones about it. Axl, tell you, Dan's his favorite singer in the world. You know. Sure. And uh, Axel, Axel, would, when we played, uh, we did like six shows in California, and Guns N' Roses came to every single show, and they were they were just a young band trying to make it. Then you know it was before they made the first album, and they actually got Manny to produce the first album. Mm. But when he got to when he got to LA, I mean, uh, he could never get more than two of the guys in the studio at the same time. You know, so. I think he gave up, you know, yeah. trying to make that first album with them. Of course, the guys became, as we all know, they became monstrous, you know. And uh, right. so, um, you know, so we always knew, and Axel was always in touch with Dan, and always in touch with Dan, and we always knew that he, he wanted to cover, you know, an Azure song. And, of course, he covered the classic, you know. And I tell you, they did it, as far as we were concerned, they did a real good version of it. I mean, generally, tell you the truth, from anything we did a cover version, we always reckon that when when we did a cover version, you've got to make the song yours. You know, you don't you don't you don't copy it. You you you, you try and do something else with it. Like I did, we did this flight tonight with Johnny Mitchell. It sounds absolutely nothing like Johnny Mitchell. You know, right. uh, and uh, you know, Hair of the Dog doesn't sound like the Everly Brothers. The, the Guns and Roses record version was just really a Nazareth version. You know. I mean, there's not much you can do with that song. You've got to play it that way. The very fact that they were the biggest band on the planet at the time, <laughs> it was a very good for us, you know. It was, it was nice. One of the best things happened there, Jay, was that there was a kind of generation there uh, that were, you know, huge Guns N' Roses fans. And as you know yourself, when you're, you, let's say yourself, you're interviewing guys, yeah. and they're saying in the interviews, oh, they like you know, the people that influenced them is this, that, and the next thing. Then the people who are reading that interview go, oh, I've got to check them out, you know. Yeah. So what happened for us, because Axel used to rave on about Dan all the time, it did us a lot of good, you know, because uh, we were we were getting checked out by all the Guns N' Roses fans, you know. So it did us a big favour, really. Absolutely. It's all new generations discovering their roots and, your roots and, and all that. Now I know Axel wanted you to play his wedding. Why? Why couldn't you do that at the time? No, it's, a, it's become a bit of a joke. Uh, actually, no. What happened is he, he, he fancied uh, he wanted Dan to sing Love Ups at the wedding because you know Axel was get, he got married to it was one of them. What, what, which one was it? Don Everly's Aaron Aaron daughter. Everly. Yeah. No, uh, it was an, an, an Everly brother's daughter. You know, yes. it was Love Ups. They were the first guys to sing it, you know, sure. all that stuff. And basically, you know, Dan, Dan would have done it actually, but we were just on tour at the time. We were we were really heavily, you know, well, we normally are, you know, we're, we're right. touring a lot. Scheduling you know, problem. Just, ah, yeah, because we were in. A, I can't remember where. I think we were in the middle of Russia or something, or the middle of Europe, someplace, you know. And it just, you know, it didn't fit. And otherwise, I'm. Yeah, Dan would have loved to have done it. I mean, of course, you know, they, they make all the jokes about, oh, well, you know, the song would have lasted longer than the marriage, you know. That's <laughs> stuff. You know, <laughs> we've been through all those jokes. Right. That was just, it was just a scare, it was just a scheduling thing. Really. Yeah, sure. Well, I know in the middle of all that, you also had Sal Clemenson from the sensational Alex Harvey band join you, and of course, right. you had a big hit with Holiday. What, what was, uh, what was it like to have Sal in the band? Well, Zal was an old friend of ours because it was actually us 
the two Alex Alex Harvey in touch with the, the sensational Alex Alex Harvey band was a band before that they were called Tear Gas and they were from Glasgow uh, in Scotland and they were absolutely fabulous they were like heavy heavy band and uh, they were just about to break up because you know they they, they, were, they had no work they weren't getting any work they weren't recording they were doing nothing but they were fantastic and Alex Harvey was doing a solo thing. He was a friend of ours uh, down in, in London. Uh, and uh, we saw him. He played with uh, friends of ours at a, at a gig. It was the Torrington Arms or something in London. And we went up to see him that night. And we said, you know, you need to get a band. Well, he was talking about getting a band. And we said, we know exactly the band for you. You should listen to these guys. And he went up to Scotland to meet Teargrass. And he was just completely blown away with them. So that became the sensational Alex Harvey band. And of course, after that, after it was uh, the manager we had at the time, a guy called Bill Fahili, uh, he was big friends with Alex and, and that band, and he was obviously big friends with us. He died in a, in a, in a, a plane accident, um, in, a, in an airplane crash. And it was 1977, and the Alex Harvey band broke up then, you know, because it, it was him that really held the whole thing together. And Zal was just a loose end, you know. He was doing, he was, I think he was driving a taxi in London or something. He was doing nothing. And in 78, it was, I think it was. So we said, we were just getting ready to make a new album at the time. The one that turned, that came, turned out to be No Mean City. And we were we were recording that over in uh, the Isle of Man, uh, in a mobile studio over at his farm in the Isle of Man. It's a wee island out in the middle of the Irish Sea where we were all living at the point. And we we said to Zal, you know, you fancy joining up with us? And we would quite like to try two guitars. Plus, I thought he was probably one of the best guitar players in the world, you know. So uh, so Zal said, yeah, sure, I'm up for it. And he came along, and uh, it was just, well, we knew he was fantastic. Because we'd been watching him for years, you know, we'd played with him for years. Mm-hmm. And he, he was just just amazing, you know. An amazing guy, amazing, amazing guy to play with on stage, you know, especially live. I mean, it was just, it, it was quite funny to you, actually, because he would be on, he was over my side of the stage when he was playing, you know, and very often, you know, I had to stop myself from, you know, stopping playing and applauding him, you know, I just thought, oh, wait a minute, I'm playing the bass, I've got to keep playing here, you know, this guy was like, absolutely, used to astound me every night, you know, what, what he was actually playing, you know, it was great, great having a, a musician of that calibre, you know, playing in the band, Um I remember actually when we went to with the second album we did, we came out and we were we did we did it was called Malice in Wonderland and with Jeff Bachelor producing. Um, yes. He produced that it was the first one, you know, and we we did half of it in the Bahamas at Compass Point, and then we decided to come and do all the the overdubs and and, then, and well, Holly was it was uh, um, Cherokee. Remember Cherokee Studios, Cherokee, yeah, down on Fairfax. So, uh, Cher- no, Bruce and all that lot. Um, so we we went there, and at the time when we were there, the Blues Brothers they were making their their album or their second album. They were trying to. Steve Cropper was producing it, and him and Jeff Baxter were big pals. They were in the other. They were in the other studio, and I remember Steve Cropper come through and he, when Zal was playing, you know, doing this overdub. I mean, Zal was in the booth, and Steve come in. He was talking to Jeff, an old pal. He said, "Who's that guy?" You know, you just couldn't believe the guy. You know. And Jeff Baxter, who's no slouch either, you know, sure. it's just like, like, uh, you know, so Jeff's going probably one of the best guitar players I've ever seen. <laughs> so that's coming from legends, you know. So you know how good the boy was, you know. Wow, and amazing it, stuff. It, I, I mean, I, I was oh, he's just incredible. And what happened at the time when, after we did, as soon as we finished that album, the second album, um, the, the management company we were in collapsed. The whole thing went to the wall. There was bankruptcies. All sorts of things happened. And we were so, you know, soaked up and doing business stuff, you know. Zal just couldn't handle it. You know, he, he said, no, I've had enough of this. And he left and formed another band, you know, another band with some other pals. Because he just got fed up, you know, with all the the nonsense that was going on around about the Nazareth camp, you know, yes. uh, which was a shame because, we, we, I mean, I really, I mean, it, we loved having the guy in the band, you know, but, uh, oh, there you go. It was it was a nice period, though. It was a nice yeah, period. well, it's amazing music you've left us. The music lives on, and, of course, uh, you know, Manny, Manny left, and 
Daryl passed in 99, and now uh, yeah. Dan retired in 13. Yeah, I guess it came down to health issues with him. He just couldn't couldn't tour and sing anymore. Right now. Yeah. Why why, why did uh, Dan retire? Oh, it's health. Um, yeah. Dan's got COPD. You know, he's got that. Um, what do you call it? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's from smoking. It's from smoking cigarettes. Too many of them. And the guy can, I mean, he's, he, it's very, very difficult for him to breathe. Um, by the time it got to, well, 2011, he was getting bad. 2012 was really bad. And by the time he got to 2013, I mean, the guy, it was, he just, when we went out and did the last tour, uh, with a tour, in fact, the last tour was in America. Yeah. And uh, we had to cancel shows there. Uh, because he just couldn't breathe. We went up to Canada and we did another three shows, I think, four, and that would have to hit it on the head because he could, he could only make it through maybe, you know, three or four songs and he had to have oxygen and another thing, you know. So then we finished the album. We came back and finished the album. He can still sing great. He's fabulous. But he can't do 90 minutes on a stage, you know. Right. Uh, what happened What happened was uh, after we finished the album, we went out to Switzerland to a festival we were doing. And he got through like three songs, the first three songs, and he completely just lost it. And he said, "No, I can't do this anymore." You know, and we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want him going through that kind of thing. Yeah, he, he was something to stand on stage with his back to the audience and use these things to breathe, and it was terrible. So he said, "No, that's it. I've got to stop." Now, in fact, what's happening is, uh, I mean, see, when you're making an album, it's fine. Because, you know, you can go and you can do a, yeah. you can do a chorus. Do it at your you pace. can do a verse. You can do a line. You know, you can do a line if you like and go and have a drink and come right. back. But you can't do that when you're doing a live, you know. So what's happening now, though, is he's, he's gone out. He's still trying to do some stuff. He's gone out to do... Uh, um, he's gone out to Russia to do one of these rock meets classic things. There's, there's him and the guy Graham Bonnet. Yep. And, uh, and the, the other guy I'm trying to remember, John... He used to play. He used to sing with Uriah Heep for a while. Okay. Uh, John, oh God. Anyway, they're doing this thing uh, this month, in fact. I think. I think it's uh, in March. But what's happening there is like it's with an orchestra and all this stuff. Uh, Dan's done the same kind of thing in Europe before. That uh, he'd do a whole set on this thing. They're working out so he can maybe do two songs, you know, in the first half, sort of thing. And then, you know, have the other guys on and stuff, and then he'll maybe do two songs in the second half of the show. Now, in light of that, well, he figures he could probably handle that, you know. Uh, I hope he can. Uh, at least he still gets to sing. He's, he's getting to go and, you know, he's still getting to do something. Because he's very, very, you can imagine, the guy's bored and frustrated, you know, not being able to do what he does best, you know. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, hopefully he can, he can do something. Bits and pieces like that, but he just kind of do do a whole whole set. So he had to leave, and that's sort of well, it's a legend, you know. That's 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 gone. Yes, the music, the it's, music uh, lives on. Now, I know you have your well, son Lee in the band now on drums, and you have your new singer uh, uh, Carl Sennett, who was with Crocus and Geezer Butler. Tell us what it's like to have your son in the band, and and what Carl brings to the group. Well, having Lee, uh, I've, I mean. Since Lee was a kid, you know, he's, I mean, all, all his boss, I mean, I've got Lee, he's the oldest. The second oldest is Stevie, Stevie Agnew. I should maybe send you a couple of his albums. Sure. Uh, he's, he's a good singer, and, uh, and I've got a bass player son, Chris, who plays, and he's in France at the moment, I think. He plays with, he's a hired gun, he plays for everybody. Uh, he's one of those guys. So when they were all young, I used to play. I, we, we went to the studio, and I would jam with them, you know, when they were kids growing up. So I played I'd played drums with Lee for years, you know, but not in Nazareth, you know. Um, when Daryl died, Dar Lee was the obvious choice, you know, from, yeah. from everybody in the band because he was a, he's a really great drummer. In fact, he was Daryl's he was one of Daryl's favourite drummers. Daryl used to go along to watch Lee because he really liked the you know playing. Mm. So it was there was you know there was no no contest. So when Daryl died, we got Lee in, and it's. I mean, it's fine, you know, because, uh, okay, right. My sons, are, they are my sons, but I think of them, I think of them more as musicians than, 
you know, when they're playing and when they're at a gig, they're musicians, they're not my sons. Right. You know? it's, uh, I mean, he's the drummer uh, when I was And as far as that, he's concerned, I'm the bass player, you know. The only time when they really become the sons is when they're looking for money, Dad. You know? <laughs> and that never changes. Right. Um, other than that, no, it's great. I mean, we almost, uh, when I'm playing, when I'm playing drums, well, it's like we're kind of, well, when we're doing this, for a running session, we're kind of joined at the hip, you know? And probably we are, <laughs> you know? G genetically, we are anyway, you know? Right. So uh, we, we, we do have a, we do have a thing, you know, when we're playing that's uh, I don't know whatever it is that chemistry, you know. Yeah. But, um, he's, he's, but he's, Lisa is a really really good songwriter. He does a lot of our material and stuff, and he's he's been he's he's more than just a drummer to the band. You know what I mean? He's got a lot he's got a lot more he, he brings a lot more influence to the band than just playing the drums. You know, sure. even his business sense actually is very good. So. It's been a great addition, a, a really great addition, you know. So it's good. It's just great having them along, and it's been and it's been what sixteen years now, you know. So sure. it's a long, long time to be in the band. As far as Carl's concerned, yeah. Well, I've never really, I've never really played with Carl except on when he came up to sing along with us last month. He came up to sing like three songs, just to let us. We'd already checked them out, you know. As you do, but already knew about the guy and everything. But uh, you know, you really need to play. It doesn't matter how good somebody is; you really got to play with them to see if they're going to be good for you. You know. Uh, and by the time the guy sung, oh, by the time he sung half a song, we thought this guy's this is the boy. I mean, he's got a phenomenal voice. He's a fabulous singer, and uh, we thought this is the boy. This is the guy to do it because we don't when when. Never want to go along looking for a sound alike, you know. If we're going to get somebody to sing, we want somebody, we want a really good singer, but we're not looking for somebody necessarily that's trying to do a Dan McCafferty, you know. And that's exactly what Carol's like. Carol sings like Carol's sentence, you know. And he was, I went to, I went to see him in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact. He was in Edinburgh. He was doing that. There, there, there's a show going around. It's the 70s rock legend thing. You know, it's a whole bunch of, it's like a nine-piece band thing that goes and does all the theatres. And they do, like, every famous, famous, famous guitar riff song, you know. And he was, uh, there's two singers, he's one of them. And that's when I saw him actually live, doing it, you know, uh, doing it um, uh, live, you know. And I, w I was completely knocked out. So was Lee and Jimmy. They came with me and we saw him. But that, by that time, we'd already asked him to be the singer. So at the moment, he's... Um, he goes out with Don Airy. He's uh, in Germany. Well, he's in Russia and Germany this month. So we haven't really had a chance to... He, he's doing that, and he's got an album to finish in Italy at the end of the month. So we don't actually play until the middle of April. You know, we've got two shows, uh, two shows up in Finland with Uriah Heep in uh, April. So we we don't really start rehearsing with uh, Carl till the end of this month, to, you know, the end of March beginning of April. So we haven't really done a Nazareth set with him yet, you know. In fact, right now, poor bastard, he's learning all the songs, you know, so he's uh, he's, he's, on, he's gone out and tour with Don, he's learned all his songs, and now he's learning all the Nazareth songs. So he must be, you know, he, I mean, it must be, you know, I was trying to think about it, you know. Somebody said to me right now, you know, you got 20 new songs to learn. I mean, geez, give me a break here, man, you know. 20 songs. We're talking lyrics, you know. It's playing them is one thing. That's In fact, it's fairly easy to learn to play 20 new songs. You know, any musician, can, anybody worth the salt can learn 20 new songs, you know. They should be able to do it in a week. But to learn the lyrics for 20 new songs. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, that's um, I'm sorry, I can do that. And the, what I was talking to Carl the other day, and he said, "Oh man, you know, for learning all these lyrics." And I was saying, "You know, you know, I've, I've been doing some of these songs that we that we've gave you to sing. I've been playing them for forty years, and I can tell you the words. You know, I don't know the words for them, and I'm up there playing them. And it was so funny, you know. Something I used to get that with Dan sometimes." He'll say, oh, God, he said, I've forgotten the words to I'll get the record and I'll have a listen to it. And he'll play it, you know. And he'll write it, write it down. And he'll say to me, could you write this down? And I'll listen to it. 
and I write the line down, and I go, is that what you're singing there? He's good. yep. I said, I've been singing that for 40 years, really? I said, I always thought you were singing something different, you know. So there you go. I'm yeah. sorry for the book, but I'm really looking forward to it, you know. I mean, we, we are really looking forward to to, to working with him. And, uh, you know, him and Dan, he's met Dan. We, we went down to Dan's house and everything, you know, when he came up. Yeah. I told Dan, this is the guy. So the two of them were, uh, they got very well together. And... Uh, so aye, everybody's everybody's got their fingers crossed here. That it's going to sh- it's going to turn out. But I feel confident that it will. You know, I've I've got a good feeling about it. You know. Well, that's great that he's been blessed by Dan, and 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 you guys are soldiering on and keeping this great music alive. All that you've seen through the years, Pete. What advice do you give to those young bands, the young, you know, musicians or songwriters today? What what is most important that they concentrate to have have a shot at finding their own sound? Well, I mean, I think babies should mainly they should believe in themselves. You know, I mean, I know it says about hacking the dart, but you know, don't take you know, take criticism. By the way, constructive criticism, fine. You know, you you take it, but if if you get hammered by the critics, really, really try and ignore it. It's hard, but try and ignore it, and you know, follow follow what you wanted, how you say it. Really, really, never, never, never waver. I said, always, really, just believe in yourself, and. Uh, and I think that that's the that's the the big big thing in, in getting there. All the business decisions you don't know they're all different. It's always different for every other band. You know the way that we came up, the way we we went through the business is different from how say some other band came up and went through the business. You know, and the business and I'd say the business name. But as far as the music's concerned, I think you've got to be really really you know com- committed to what you do, and especially if it's a group, if it's a band, you know. You've got to be, believe in yourself and really, really believe in all the other boys that are with you in that band. And that, that, that's, that, I, I remember all the time with us, you know, we'd, we would get, you, you, you would get, you get criticism that would sometimes you'd think, oh, this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. And you think, no, we always thought this was, this is what we wanted, this is it. Just, really, really believe in yourself. I, I can't say that enough, you know. Well, that's great advice. We, we certainly appreciate your time and, and look forward to great music to come. 